When you hear the word glaciers, what do you think of? Cold? Antarctic? Some kind of icy river? One word that probably won't come to mind is tropical. Like a snowman singing a song about ice in the summer, there's something that just doesn't feel right. I mean, ice melts pretty easily. Princess and ugly don't go together. But tropical glaciers do actually exist. It might sound surprising if you live somewhere temperate and boringly devoid of persistent bodies of ice, but there are glaciers in Mexico, Kenya, Tanzania, Indonesia, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru. In fact, according to the Randolph Glacier Inventory, there might be as much as 220 gigatons of glacial ice at low latitudes around the globe. That's about 30 times the volume of the Loch Ness. Just frozen solid near the equator. And it's kind of a big deal. Not just for climate scientists, but for the hundreds of thousands of people whose lives depend on tropical glaciers. So, how do they get there in the first place? In principle, glaciers can form anywhere that snow falls more quickly than it melts away. As snow accumulates on the surface, so the snowflakes underneath are compacted and recrystallized into denser grains of ice, known as fern. Over time, the weight of the overlying material squeezes these grains of fern closer and closer together until they can form a singular, dense network of glacial ice. The upshot of this is that glaciers can form whenever there are sub-zero temperatures, high snowfall, or some combination of the two. Antarctic glaciers are at one extreme of this scale. As trivia nerds will know, Antarctica is the world's largest desert, as the atmospheric conditions don't really favour the formation of any precipitation at all. In fact, snowfall is so rare that it can take literally thousands of years to form a glacier. But, once formed, they are extremely stable and it would take something pretty catastrophic to get rid of them. Somebody's gotta tell him. Tropical glaciers are on pretty much the other extreme end of the scale. Even at the high altitudes of the Andes, daily temperatures regularly exceed zero degrees Celsius, so the ice is pretty much melting all year round. Tropical glaciers therefore need a lot of snowfall in their accumulation zones in order to balance out the mass lost at the other end, whether that comes spaced out over the year, or all at once during the wet season. It sounds simple, but it's probably worth stressing that we are only talking about snowfall here, not precipitation. Rain won't freeze the moment it lands on a glacier. In fact, it'll probably melt some of the snow around it before running off the glacier altogether. Which is why we don't tend to get glaciers anywhere called Aberdeen. Of course, at tropical latitudes, there's only really one place you can go to find snowfall. Mountains. And we're talking big mountains too. The vast majority of low latitude glaciers are more than 4,000 metres above sea level. The reason behind this is that in the troposphere, that is, the part of the atmosphere where we live, air temperature usually goes down as altitude goes up. This is because the Earth's surface is much better than the air at absorbing incoming solar radiation, meaning that the sun heats the Earth, and then the Earth heats the troposphere. There are all kinds of atmospheric processes that can complicate this, but for all of you who want a general rule, we can say that the temperature goes down by about 1 degree Celsius for every 100 meters of altitude that we gain. So if it's 10 degrees Celsius in the valley, you're probably going to have to climb about 1,000 meters in order to get to the glacier. So to recap, Tropical glaciers form where it is wet enough that precipitation outweighs melt, and high enough that precipitation falls mostly as snow. In the northern and eastern hemispheres, there are only a few places that meet these requirements. Massive mountains like Puncak Jaya, Kilimanjaro, and Pico de Orizaba. Collectively, these sites account for about 5% of the world's tropical glaciers. The remaining 95% can all be found in the tropical Andes. The tropical Andes are uniquely well placed for sustaining glaciers. Along most of the Andes, air temperatures are significantly lower than would be expected for the latitude, thanks to the particularly high altitude of the mountains and the nearby Humboldt Current, which brings cold ocean water up the Pacific coast of South America. One side effect of these factors is a stable mass of dry air in which rain droplets are unable to coalesce, which is bad news for glaciers. However, the tropical Andes also benefit from occasional interference from the intertropical convergence zone, which migrates south in January, breaking up the stable air mass and bringing with it the rain that characterizes the wet season. In other words, the tropical Andes are in the glacial equivalent of the Goldilocks zone, neither cool and dry like the Atacama Desert to the south, nor hot and wet like Brazil to the east and Panama to the north. So if tropical glaciers are so abundant, then why don't we talk about them more? Well, the short answer is that most reporting of climate change over the last three decades has focused on rising sea levels. 
And while 200 gigatons of melting ice is nothing to sniff at, it's a drop in the ocean compared with the 24 million gigatons of ice in the Antarctic ice sheets. If every tropical glacier in the world melted right now, global sea levels would only increase by about 0.2 millimetres. That's not to say that tropical glaciers aren't important to climate scientists. Given their small size, high rates of accumulation and melting, and the disproportionate effects of climate change at high altitudes, tropical glaciers are much more sensitive to changes in climatic conditions than glaciers found at mid and high latitudes. This means that we can effectively use them as canaries in a coal mine, indicators of what's to come. However, the real value of tropical glaciers lies not in their size, nor in their responsiveness to climate change, but in their connections to communities and ecosystems. Take the Peruvian Cordillera Blanca, for example. Around 270,000 people live in the Callejón de Huaylas, a long river valley between two Andean mountain ranges. The western range is called the Cordillera Negra, and it looks like something from a Martian landscape. Arid, rocky, almost completely lacking in vegetation. The eastern side of the valley, on the other hand, is almost the complete opposite. Verdant, populated and alive. This range is called the Cordillera Blanca. So named because it is home to around one quarter of the world's tropical glaciers, collectively covering an area of almost 500 square kilometres. Meltwaters from these glaciers visibly fertilise the eastern side of the Callejón de Huaylas and feed the Rio Santa. This, in turn, sustains the largest cities in the region and drives one of the most important power plants in Peru. The impact of the glaciers is most obvious in the dry season. Between June and August, the Callejón de Huaylas gets just 4.5 millimetres of precipitation per month. That's less than the average rainfall of the Sahara Desert. In the Cordillera Negra, many rivers dry up altogether, but the glaciers keep on melting. According to the Andean Glacier and Water Atlas, during a normal dry season, up to two-thirds of the water supply in Moraz will come from glacial meltwaters. In a drought year, this can go as high as 90%. 90%! Just from glaciers. Tropical glaciers are a gorgeous example of balance in nature. Constantly moving, constantly melting, and yet always in roughly the same place. They represent an important reservoir in the tropical water cycle, and a reminder of our ever-shifting climate and it genuinely makes me sad to read paper after paper about their decline. Can they be saved? I doubt it. But I do know that it's not too late to help the communities and ecosystems that will be left behind when they're gone. Callejón de Huaylas. Callejón de Guaylas, Callejón.